back to my original theme about how wonderful this country is in which we live. It has virtually every kind of environment that you would want. And it also has so many types of opportunities for people. You know, you think about the fact that this country declared its independence in 1776. And less than 100 years from that, was the number one economic power in the world. It is really an amazing place. And think about this. A hundred years before America came on the scene, five hundred years, a thousand years, five thousand years, people did things the same way. Within two hundred years of America coming on the scene, men were walking on the moon. It fundamentally changed humanity. And it, if anybody tells you that this is not an exceptional nation, they have no idea what they're talking about. It's the most exceptional nation the world has ever known. And it is our duty to make sure that that remains the case for those who are coming after us. You know, many people have said to me, why? after a wonderful medical career, would you dare stain your reputation with something as horrible as politics? And I asked myself that too. But, <laughs> but I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because my entire professional career revolved around saving the lives of children and providing them providing them with a quality of life. And I cannot sit idly by and watch their future being squandered, the policies of our government right now. You know, it was, it was Thomas Jefferson who said it is immoral to pass debt to the next generation. If we could transport him from wherever to the modern day and put him on the stage and he found out how much debt we were passing on, he would stroke out immediately. I mean, he would not be able to believe what we are doing to those who are coming behind us. And, you know, the, the whole threat of fiscal responsibility seems to have left us. With somebody who really believed in fiscal responsibility. She was one of 24 children and got married when she was 13 and they moved from rural Tennessee to Detroit. Years later she discovered that her husband was a bigamist and uh, you know, resulted in divorce. Well, you know, we ended up moving and uh, we were living in a horrible situation in the ghetto. Everything you can imagine, rats and roaches, sirens, gangs, murders, you name it, it was all going on. But she was out working extraordinarily hard. Two, three jobs at a time, leaving the house at five in the morning, getting back after midnight. Because she didn't want to be on welfare. The reason she didn't want to be on welfare is because she was very observant. And she noticed that the people that she saw go on welfare never came off of it. So she didn't want to be dependent on anybody else. She never felt sorry for herself. And that was a wonderful thing. The, uh, the problem is she never felt sorry for us either. So there, there was never any excuse that would be acceptable. She would always say, do you have a brain? And if the answer was yes, then you could have thought way out of it. But, you know, the interesting thing is she was so thrifty. She saved every penny, every nickel, every dime, every quarter. She would drive a car until it wouldn't make a sound. And then she would collect all of her money and she would go and buy a new car. And people would say, how could that woman afford a new car? She must be selling drugs or selling her body. She must be doing something. No, she was just being fiscally responsible. And that was something that she taught us to do also. And it's such an important concept. And I can tell you something. 
If my mother was a Secretary of Treasury, we would not be in a deficit situation. But, you know, to compound the problem, I was a terrible student. And, uh, the problem, no one else thought I was smart either. And in fact, they all call me dummy. They always make jokes about me. And uh, I remember once we were having an argument on the school playground about who was the dumbest person in the school. And it wasn't a big argument because they all agreed it was me. But then someone tried to extend the argument to who was the dumbest person in the world. And I said, wait a minute, there are built people in the world. And they said, yep, and you're the dumbest one. <laughs> so that wasn't too pleasant to compound the problem. We had a mech quiz that afternoon. I felt that since they were printed on the back of the notebooks that you could just look them up if you need them. So, so that didn't work out. So we took the clip. I got a zero. When you had to pass it to the person behind you, they would correct your paper, give it back to you. Teacher would call your name out loud. You had to report your score loud, which is great if you got 100 or 95. Not so great. If, like me, you had a zero and just had an argument about who was the dumbest person in the world. So I knew they were going to laugh hysterically when I said zero. So I started scheming. I said, I know what I'll do. When the teacher knows my name, I'll mumble. And she'll think I said one thing, and the girl behind me will think I said something else. So she called my name. I said, man. And she said, no, I think that you got nine over, this is wonderful. I knew you could do it, crap, this is a day to day thing, but I've got nine over. It had 30 questions. She was just so happy. And uh, finally the girl behind me couldn't take it any longer. And she stood up and she said, he said none. Well, the kids were swirling in the aisles. And I would have disappeared into thin air if I could have. You couldn't be seen again in the history of the world, but I couldn't. So I had to sit there and act like it didn't bother me. But it did. It bothered me a lot. Not enough to make me study, but it bothered me a lot, you know. I was anxious to get out, to go out and play, recess, school was out, baseball, basketball, dodgeball, any kind of ball, you name it. I wanted to throw in rocks at cars, remember that? Anybody throw rocks at cars when they were Hey, we got a lot of honest people in Colorado. This is good. You know you all did, but, but just the ones who raise their hand are honest. But at any rate, um, no, why was it so much fun? Because sometimes those old people would get angry, and they would stop the car, and they would get out, and they would chase you. And we would run slowly to encourage them. <laughs> And then when they were nearby, we were gone. But you know, sometimes the police would come and unmarked cars, and we wouldn't know it was the police until they were right there. And we'd be running like crazy, and they'd be chasing us. There were these tall fences; they were about ten feet tall, just like at the border in Arizona. And uh, <laughs> and they would think that they had trapped us. But they had no idea how good we were at getting all those fences. I mean, full speed ahead like an Olympic event, never break speed, leap high up to the fence, let the momentum of your feet sweep over the top, drop down on the other side, and laugh at them because they couldn't do that. Now that was back in the days before they would shoot you. And then I, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding, you know. Actually, that gives me a segue because I love the police. You know, they put their life, they put their life, they put their life on the line for us every single day when they put that uniform on. And, you know, people who give the police a heart, and I always say, imagine your life 24 hours with police. For 24 hours. I mean, people will come into your house 
And they would say, I like that TV. I'm taking that TV. And then they said, you know, better still, you get out. I'm taking your house. You know, they are the ones who maintain the Thank you. Even having grown up in horrible situations, there has never been a time when I have had a conflict with a police officer, ever. Never happened because my mother always taught me to be respectful of the law. Now that's not to say I didn't have a disagreement. <laughs> I got a ticket one. I was very unhappy because I was in a place and I didn't see that this that it was a new area and it's an area where it normally be 55, but since it was new, it was only 40. And I said to the police officer, why did it say that? And he said, when you first came on. I said, I thought that was the ramp speed. No, he said, that's the speed of the whole thing. So I said, that's not fair. He said, go to court. So I went to court, and the judge, he was just slamming everybody. I said, oh, no, I should have just paid the ticket. And when I came up, he said, well, what do you do? I said, I'm a neurosurgery resident at Johns Hopkins. And he said, really? He said, so you know my good fishing buddy, Dr. John Chambers? I said, yeah, we all break together all the time. He said, case is missed. <laughs> <laughs> that was really, really good. And then, and then I had another episode. I was in Australia, and uh, we were coming down this hill. And of course, you picked up speed coming down the hill. So they were down there with their radars, and uh, everybody was coming out of the whole parking lot full of people that they were giving tickets to. I said, you know, this is entrapment. I said, of course, cars pick up speed. They said, go to court. Well, I went to court. This judge was really in a foul mood. And then everybody had lawyers. I didn't have a lawyer. And I said, oh, no. But I went out and I said, you know, they're down there with the radar. The radar operates on a Doppler principle, and the signal is degraded when you're on an angle, so they went to the base of the hill, and I went through all this stuff, and he was fascinated, he said, case dismissed. <laughs> that was good. But now, my, my real point here is that we need to make sure that we teach our children to be respectful of the law. We also need to acknowledge that that police, like any other profession, have rogue people in them. Now, when you get work done in your house by a plumber, and he happens to be a bad plumber, do you sort of decide that all plumbers are bad, and that you should go out and shoot plumbers? That doesn't make any sense. Nor does it make any sense to indict all police because you have somebody who is a little bit on the wrong side. You know, we have to be more intelligent than this. And all we are doing is allowing people to manipulate us and make us think there is a problem where the problem does not exist. Now, one of the things that I, I have strongly suggested is, you know, when it comes to uh, the community relationships with police is the whole concept of community policing, introducing police early on and having the same police in the community so that people get to know them. And that way, little Johnny's first encounter with a police officer is somebody he knows, somebody he's playing catch with, somebody who is a friend as opposed to somebody who's chasing him. And I think that makes a huge difference in the way that things are done. That's the way it used to be done in America. And I think we can take some lessons from that. There's a lot of things that we can do if we sit down and negotiate and talk about how we solve problems as opposed to getting in respective corners and throwing hand grenades at each other. And that's the way we do not only with that issue but with so many other issues and that will destroy us. A wise man once said a house divided against itself cannot stand. The other issue that I think will destroy us quickly is our debt. You know, 18 plus trillion dollars of debt 
Now, you know, that is such a staggering number. We can say it, but do we comprehend what that number actually means? To pay that back, $18 trillion at a rate of $10 million a day, 365 days a year, it would take 5,000 years. And that is what we are putting on the backs of our young people. That is, in fact, immoral. It will, in fact, destroy them. Now, that is the good news, because the real number is the fiscal gap. And please look that up when you go home tonight. That is the unfunded liabilities that we owe. Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all the departmental programs, the cabinet programs going forward versus the revenues we expect to from taxes and other, other uh, sources. Those two numbers should be identical if we were fiscally responsible. But when they're not, we bring them forward to modern numbers. That's the gap. That gap right now is over $200 trillion. This is what we owe. The only reason we can sustain that level of debt is because we can print money. We are the reserve currency of the world. No one else can print money. And if we couldn't print money, you would see a major, major collapse. It would make what happened in 1929 look like a walk in the park. And we may not always be able to print money. There is a move afoot to, to change the system throughout the world. We have a grace period right now uh, in order to get this fixed. But we have got to be serious and we have got to put the kind of people in office who understand this because you'll notice that no or very few traditional politicians will talk about the fiscal gap because they want to get reelected. But I'm not a politician and that's why I talk about it. It's very important that we understand. Because unless we the people understand what our financial condition is, we will continue to be easily manipulated by slick politicians who come along and tell you that, you know, we should give free college to everybody. We can just borrow more money and we can just drive the debt. I gotta tell you a secret. If I were trying to destroy America, if I was in charge and I was trying to destroy this country, what I would do is I would try to drive wedges between all the people and create as much friction as I possibly could. I would drive the national debt to such incredible levels. I would try to get everybody I could to be on social welfare programs. I would be bringing people in from other countries and try to get them on social welfare programs. I would be giving people free telephones. I would be offering people free college. I would just drive that debt to an incredible level and destabilize the financial foundation. And I would weaken the military. And I would demoralize the military. And I would treat the veterans badly so that people wouldn't want to volunteer for the military. And I would neglect the electrical grid, which needs to be hardened. And I would be negligent with cybersecurity. And I would do all the things that seem to be happening right now, which hopefully is just coincidental. <laughs> but, but you know, here's the, here's the good news. We actually can get the economic situation straightened out in this country because this country has the most powerful, dynamic economic engine that the world has ever known. And the problem is that we've got it wrapped up with a gazillion regulations. It makes it very hard to get anything done anymore. You know, let me give you just one example. The, the employer mandate associated with the unaffordable care. You know, think about it. It, it used to be, it used to be in our country that when you started a new business, you would be so proud and you would call your mother and you'd say, Mom, Mom, I started a new business. I got 10 employees. And the next year you had 20 and then 30 and then 40. And now, ooh, better stop. Don't want to hit 50. 
that employer mandate kicks in and all kinds of things start happening to you and to your profits. Does that make any sense at all to have something like that going on when small business is the backbone of this country? That's what helps us to grow. <laughs> also, also recognize that every single regulation costs us money goods and services. It increases the price of goods and services. You know, I remember, you know, I had to resign from all my corporate boards to take on this, but we would sit around and talk about all the things that we had to do now to comply with Dodd-Frank and other kind of silly things that were going on, and you have to hire all these people in order to do it. Well, guess who gets to pay for that? The consumers do. Because all that cost is passed on. Every regulation cost is passed on to us. And it disproportionately affects the poor and the middle class. doesn't affect rich people anywhere near because they all have to pay the same cost. That's one of the things that's driving the income disparity. You'll have the socialists and the progressives telling you that the problem is rich people and that they're causing all of your problems. No, the problem is all of these stupid regulations and these policies that are killing the middle class and killing other people in our country. And it's time for some truth. And, you know, they don't like the fact that I go around and talk about this stuff and bring it up so that people start thinking about it and talking about it because the only way that they can carry out their nefarious purposes is if people are not well informed. That is the problem. And you know, that was something that my mother understood because there I was, this horrible student doing poorly, but she knew that if I could only get well educated, and my brother also, that we could have a different life than she had. And she prayed and she asked God to give her the wisdom to know what to do to get her young sons to understand intellectual development. And you know what? God gave her the wisdom, at least in her opinion. You know, my brother and I didn't think it was wise, but you know, it was turn off the TV and make us read books, which I hated and make us do book reports, which she couldn't read, but we didn't know that. But you know, the, but as I started reading those books, particularly as I started reading about people of accomplishment, it became very clear to me that the person who has the most to do with what happens to you in life is you. It's not somebody else. It's not the environment. And I stopped listening. I stopped listening to all the people who were always talking about what you can't do, you know, and and really that actually had a profound effect on my medical career too, because people are always saying you can't do this, this has never been done before, but you know, developing that mindset where you begin to think for yourself, use that God-given intellect, it really doesn't matter whether something has been done before or not. That's what's known as innovation. That's what's known as creativity. That's what made America into a great nation. And I believe that we have the ability to do that again. Once I understood that, you know, I became an A student, went right to the top of the class, from the bottom of the class, the same students who were calling me dummy, were coming to me saying, Benny, 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 how do you work this problem? And I would say, sit at my feet, youngster, while I instruct you. <laughs> I was perhaps a little obnoxious, but it sure felt good to say that to those turkeys. But you know what? It was that can-do attitude, that same can-do attitude that characterized the rapid rise of this country from nowhere to the pinnacle, and not only the pinnacle, but the highest pinnacle that has ever been reached in the history of the world. And guess what? We can do it again. And it's going to require... It's going to require that we all get involved. Every single person here 
as a sphere of influence. And we can use that sphere of influence. You know, in the pre-revolutionary days, they didn't like what King George III was doing, his tyranny, and they began to have town meetings. They would call everybody together. And they would talk about what kind of country did they want to have? What did they want to pass on to their children and their grandchildren? What were they willing to fight for? What were they willing to die for? And they encouraged each other. And that's how a ragtag bunch of militiamen defeated the most powerful and professional military force on earth. That was America. That's what we were able to do. I got to tell you something else about that group. They were also people of faith. They believed in God. And you know, the revisionist, the re revisionist will tell you that our founders did not believe in God, not really. They were deists. They just believed that there was a, maybe something and it set something in motion, but it didn't have anything to do with our lives. But all you have to do is go back and read the writings of our founders. And if you read, if you read the book, America the Beautiful, that Candy and I put out in 2012, it gives the actual quotes of these people. You can see that those are not things that would be said by a deist. And we have to stop listening so much to the secular progressives who are making it their point to get God out of our lives. I don't think that that's an appropriate thing in this country. Well, because, because we are not like everybody else, so we shouldn't be trying to emulate them. They need to emulate us. You know, there is an American way. Have you noticed that? There is no French way, there is no English way, there is no Portuguese way, there's an American way. And you can be un-American, but you can't be un-Canadian or un-Venezuelan. There is something very unique about our country. It is something we need to be proud of and we don't need to give it away. And And that's why I reel strongly against giving away the values and principles that made us great for the sake of political correctness. And I will never submit to political correctness. They can just go away. But, but think about all of those who preceded us. And think about how brave they were and what they were willing to give up so that we could be free and so that we could be prosperous. Think back to D-Day and our soldiers as they invaded the shores of Normandy and they were being mowed down by machine gun fire. Hundreds of people laying on the beach, a thousand soldiers lying dead. And did our soldiers turn back? Were they afraid? Yes, they were afraid, but they did not turn back. They stepped over the bodies of their dead comrades, and they rushed the Axis forces, and they overwhelmed them, knowing in many cases that they would never see their loved ones. They would never see their homeland again. But why did they do it? Not for themselves. They did it for you, and they did it for me because they cared about us and they cared about our future. And you know what? Now, now the responsibility is ours. And if we care about those who are coming behind us, it is time for us to pick up the baton of freedom and never to submit it and to always be willing to stand up for what we believe in because freedom is not free. We must fight for it every day and that fights us right now. Thank you very much.